We uh, thought we'd do a few questions and answers at the end of our advanced fine art printing workshop this week, where it's July of 2011. So, who might have a question they'd like answered? Andy's got one here. Um, so yeah, I it's actually like a multifaceted question, I guess. So this week's been all about printing, and you know you work hard to get this print that looks exactly how you want it, and then I guess how do you go about sharing that? in other mediums, so if you want to throw it on the internet, stuff like that, how do you take this image that you process in this way, and it lots of times doesn't look the same on the computer as it does when you print, and I guess the other facet of that question is, with all these calibrated monitors, is there an approach to, say, putting stuff on the internet for like a Mac monitor to look at, or a Windows monitor, or something that, you know, you're looking at it on this calibrated monitor, but then everyone else is looking at it on their non-calibrated monitors. Well, the most you can do in that kind of situation is put a profile that attempts to describe those generalized conditions, and that's what sRGB is. It stands for S standard sRGB, and it was an attempt to characterize out-of-control monitors and try and come up with a, a general color space that would accommodate those. So. Putting them in sRGB on the internet is probably the best you can do. In terms of what you might do to make the image look more like the print, it's sort of the reverse. Usually you're trying to make the print look like the file. And if in fact the print ends up evolving in some different look and feel because of the interaction you've had with the craft of making the print, then I would just go back and attempt to edit any of those changes into the file itself if in fact they need to be brought in and let that be the rendition that you show to the world. So, in that sense, uh, both are kind of wild cards, but in terms of the intent of what you were trying to do, it's fairly straightforward. That kind of makes sense? Okay. Anybody else have questions that I want to ask? Question. It's a workflow question. Okay. Um, it's in reference to uh, image size. Mm -hmm. And the question is, is there any need to change the image size anywhere in the workflow before uh, one is ready to print. Uh, and a corollary or a question on that is what exactly happens when you scale an image to print? What happens to the pixel? Uh, when you're scaling down? Well, down or up. Well, uh, you're either throwing away pixels or you're making more up. And so as you make more up to get bigger, the, the image is going to get softer. As you scale things down, you're either going through a process of calculating them down or essentially kind of throwing away data, depending on the kind of uh, uh, algorithmic routine that's going on. Uh, I suppose that the, easily the best quality downsizing is going to be done in Photoshop rather than in a printer driver. But the printer driver provides a convenience for being able to get down to, say, a 9-inch wide print for 11-inch wide paper uh, without downsizing your file in reality and allowing you to do a nice test while still preserving the data that you would have cropped away or downsized away if you downsized to fit that size. So in a sense, what I always try and do is think of the smaller prints as proofs where the downward interpolation that the printer driver might be doing is less than ideal but preserves that bigger data set so that the file you're editing is the file you can turn around and print on a bigger piece of paper. So um, ideally downsize it, fit it to exactly what you want in Photoshop or enlarge it if you must, but be modest about your expectations of even more data made up than you've already got made up from the Bayer pattern technology in most of these cameras to begin with. So we've had a good week of uh, learning from you and learning from one another. Give us a little bit of counsel on, you know, as we go back to day jobs and normal lives, of uh, the best way to hone the craft over time is to develop as as photographers or, or fine art printers, maybe more specifically. Uh, what recommendations for practice or habit do you recommend for that? Well, the single best thing you do is keep doing it to uh, work and work and work and not let too much time go by without some sort of printing taking place. And uh, even if that's as little as a day a week, it's something that gives you a chance to keep your hands 
active in the process. And of course, all these inkjet printers are going to enjoy being printed in terms of no head clogs or fewer head clogs the more ink you run through. And so in that sense, even if you can only devote a couple of hours a week in a busy week, it's still better to just keep at it and keep doing it. Other than that, the biggest recommendation I can give is find some mechanism to share your work and show it to other people so you build a community of people that both can give you a sense of uh, having accomplished a kind of communication and at the same time a reassurance that the work has some value to other humans. We can all have our families praise us but, and friends, but if it's a group of interested image makers, I think sometimes it gives us a little bit more encouragement to think that, in fact, we've done something special. That's a large part of the reason camera clubs are around, because they give that community. Camera clubs have their own aesthetic criteria that sometimes get in the way of people's aspirations and sometimes support them. So that can be both uh, both negative and positive depending on the environment, the judges, and the pe uh, individual's desires. Uh, I think that's the best recommendations I could give. Keep doing it even if it's only a few hours a week and, uh, and find, uh, see if you can find a shared community to be a part of. Hmm. I think this workshop was really wonderful because it gave us the opportunity to really work and I hope that maybe <coughs> you'll have more workshops like this. More like the advanced workshop? Exactly. This particular workshop worked out almost exactly as I would have hoped in the sense that you get that individual time. And as I was saying earlier this afternoon, that chance to really work together on goals and share some of the challenges that are encountered as demonstrations, yet not be so heavy laden with the presentations like a um, a beginning or even intermediate class might be, but really have a chance to work through the problems and the prints. And so, uh, yeah, I think it worked out well too, and I'm glad you feel that way. It, it uh, was a useful week in that sense, I think. So, I will probably try offering it again. We'll see uh, what kind of interest it generates. Is there one piece of uh, advice that you've received along your path as a photographer that maybe is the most valuable or among the most valuable to help you develop your craft? I think probably the best advice I ever got was from my friend Ralph Putzker when I first met him uh, in Levining Canyon near Mona Lake when he was chairman of the art department at San Francisco State. I was about to transfer up there and I didn't know anybody and uh, became friends with he and my good friend Al Weber on that trip. Uh, and Ralph said the single most important thing to do is to just photograph a lot and then print a lot. That doing it is really the best possible thing you could do. And he said even as someone immersed in education, he said, I don't care if you go to school or not, just do it and do it a lot. And uh, part of what I think distinguishes people who um, have creative outlets is possibly because in one way or another they have to have that creative outlet. There's something in their own personalities, souls if you will, that just needs that. And if in fact that's the case, that you have this need to express yourself, this need to, to have creative outlets, you've just got to listen to that and let that be part of what drives you forward because what ends up happening is uh, you give vent to the impulse and the impulse feeds the desire to work and it just becomes this uh, this loop of uh, must do, will do, yes I've done and now I'm going to do more and it uh, it becomes one of the meanings we attach to our lives and I think that that's a precious thing I think that's we have a history of art and music and poetry because people have a compulsive need to create and thank goodness that they do because our lives are all much richer because of that and uh, so the best advice I could give to you I think would be what my my dear dear friend Ralph said to me just get out and do it and don't stop just keep keep doing it